So there's a game called Traders of Genoa, but now it's just called Genoa, right? I played there's a there was an original printing in the U.S. that said Traders of Genoa on it. I played that a long time ago, back in uh, Beacon, Poughkeepsie, actually at Moz. And then for some reason, I didn't go to that Moz meeting. Yeah, uh, that guy. Remember, we went to his apartment. He was there. He played it with us. But the, it was brought by this red-haired guy. You Wait, didn't the meet. apartment with the bird? Yes. Okay, where I we like played that Shadows over Camelot and, and then the, They were like the two cool people in town who then disappeared. But there was a, there was another cool person who you did not see that was there. He the was red-haired the one who guy. Owned, yeah, he, I never he, played a game with him. Yeah, he owned Traders of Genoa and he played at that time. How come the three cool people literally disappeared and we had no contact that's info? You, that, that's what you get for not going every time. No, but we. We, we, they disappeared and somehow we had no way to contact I think I them. have a business card from one of the guys. You should email them and be like, hey, you still in Poughkeepsie? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so I played the game then and the whole gist of the game uh, is that it's a game where all the bits in the game are tradable, right? So... It's like, you know, you play Monopoly, and it's like, you're not really allowed to just trade money with people, right? It's like, you can, I guess it's in the rules, you can trade properties, and it's like, you know, a lot of games that have trading have really, that even have trading at all, have like incredibly... Like settlers, you can trade resources for resources in a very constrained yes, manner. Yes, there are very few games that have ultra-free-form trading, and Traders of Genoa also does not have completely free-form trading. You can only trade with the person whose turn it is, right? And you can only only make trades that are binding and immediate. The only other kind of trade you can make that's binding is if somebody is going to go into a workshop, and this will make no sense if you've never played it, you can trade with them for the goods the workshop would produce when they go into it, right? So... Uh, other than that, you, you can't really do anything. But the interesting thing is all the different pieces in the game, you know, the cardboard pieces, cards, tokens, money, resource goods, you know, all the different kinds of bits. And there's a bunch of them. There's like four or five, six different kinds of bits can all be traded. So you can be like, I'll give you $3 and a tree for your uh, contract and a beer. You know, you so you can really go crazy with that, and that is the core of the fun and awesomeness of this game. Um, so it's had a recent reprinting in the United States, where it's just called Genoa instead of Traders of Genoa, but it is the exact same goddamn game as far as I can tell, only newly printed with new art, that kind of thing going on. Bigger, I think it's slightly uh, larger uh, in its construction. You know, I big, have no way to tell. Bigger board, bigger pieces. I think I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, but it's the same game, and it's just as fun, and we own it, and we've now both played it many more times. Now, the the, the gist of it is pretty simple. You basically, it's hard to really explain a lot of the bits without looking at a board, but basically, you move around this board, like you have a trail you leave, like a slime trail of traders, and every turn, you're like, Trader, well, not traitor. I could move it here or move it there. What do you guys want me to do? And Scott will be like, I'll give you a beer and five bucks if you move it there and let me do the thing. Right, because basically you move this train of discs around the board and they all have to be in a line, but you could sort of, you know, you follow a path. Think of it as there is a guy, he's walking around town doing errands. In one day, he can walk five squares, right? And in those five squares, he's going to go into certain buildings and do errands in each of those buildings that he walks into, right? One person on is controlling the guy who walks around town, and he moves all five spaces. Every time he goes into a building, one of the players at the table gets to do the errand in that building, but only once. So you can't normally do two different buildings in the same turn. If I do the brewery, that's it for me this turn. I can't also do the city hall in the same turn, right? So even though I'm controlling the guy walking around the town, only one of the buildings that I walk into, I can keep, I can do myself. The other buildings I walk into, other people at the table are going to do those buildings, which means I need to get them to pay me to let them do those buildings, or I can just end my turn immediately. Now, if I haven't taken my action yet, like I'm the trader doing the thing, if I haven't taken my action yet, I could always be like, well, I'm going to use it myself, unless someone else gives me another bid. But if, I, if I'm going to go into a place and someone actually does offer me, like offers me something, I have to take it or end my turn. Right, basically. like if no one at the table wants anything that's adjacent to Rim, right? And I say, Rim, I'll give you $1 for the thing next to you. He either has to say yes and let me have it or do it himself or end his turn. Those are the only three options available to him. 
Now, the other cool thing about this game is, like Scott said, you can trade anything for anything, and there's a spatial clue-like component of what's close to what and moving around, and there, mm-hmm. there's all these different bits. Like, you can get a contract, yep. which, you, which has, like, there's things that have to do with having, like, a number of contracts adjacent to each other, or, like, deals where, like, get these particular combinations of goods and then cash them in at this place or have the trader go between this place and this place in one turn. So you have hidden information of here are my goals that will get me a bunch of money and everyone else has their own hidden goals and you're all trying to negotiate to maximize your own goals and minimize the goals of others. Mm. Oh, but did I mention that the way to win this game, the only thing that matters is at the very end, how much money do you have? Right, that's all that matters at the end, and of course, at the end of the game, a lot of some of the things you have, like contracts, can be converted into money straight up, depending on you know what you have. But a lot of the things are worth no money at the end of the game. Like if you just have a beer sitting there at the end of the game, it's worth nothing. There might be some tiebreakers involving things like that, but I'm not sure what they are. I don't have the rules in front of me. So really, it's all about just getting as much money as possible, and all these other bits are just means of getting money. Now, now a lot of them, if you get them in the right combinations and time could be worth like a hundred bucks so like if you're if some if, if rim is like he really wants a beer i th- i see he has a large contract i know that with that beer he could potentially get a hundred bucks so i'm gonna be like rim this beer is basically you know it's what's it actually worth in the game overall eh, maybe 10 you know who knows what but to you at this moment in time it is worth a hundred dollars so if you want it you're going to have to pay out the nose <laughs> right it's like it's it's worth you know at least 50 right because that'll be sort of fair but i want to win so i'll give you give me 60 for it right and that's the kind of shit that goes on in this game it's like oh if if someone else wanted the beer i'd be like oh 10 bucks because i know that you only have a small contract which means the most you could get from this beer would be 30 you know so that all that kind of stuff comes into play where you're looking at what the other guy has to figure out how much the thing is worth to them, now, as opposed is, to how much something is worth on a global marketplace. Now, what's interesting is that this game shares two very important aspects with another game that we play a lot, and I think we've talked about on the show, Modern Art. Mm. One, the one of the mediums you use for bidding and trading is also victory points in mm. both games. Mm-hmm. And two, both games get around the settler's problem of it's not actually like no one actually wants to trade or do business because in both this game and modern art the mechanics basically force you to trade well, and do business i think the other game that does that of course is uh Pizarro. bonanza <laughs> bonanza too right it's it's People, if you're playing, but you're not trading victory right, points if in you're, that game. Right? No, that's true. It only shares but it one had, aspect. But it, it forced you to trade, right? It does. Is that you? If you have a game where there is trading, people, if it's if it's just free form trading, there is no reason to trade with anyone unless you're ripping them off. Therefore, right? If all players playing are smart and it is not possible to rip anyone off because anyone will reject a rip off trade, no one will trade. But trading is fun, and you—that's part of the—that's why settlers isn't fun, or very fun, when you have good players because no one trades, and the whole fun of the game is like brick for wood. All right. So, in order to have a fun game for smart people with trading that is fun, you need something to force people to make it a good idea to trade, even if you're not getting ripped off. And what Genoa does to make that happen is they give you multiple opportunities when it's your turn to where, sure, your turn could end right here, but... If you go and you walk your little guy and you move the tower into other buildings, allowing other people to run errands in those buildings, they will pay you and you will get resources this turn, you know, right now that you could use. If you end the turn, you're not getting anything for the rest of this turn. So even though you're helping other people, you will also be helping yourself in this turn versus ending it right now. And if everyone just went into one building and ended their turn on every single action... If one person didn't do that, that person would be pretty much guaranteed to win because of all the extra stuff they'd be getting. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a good idea to let people pay you to do things. Games like this really put into stark contrast games that involve trading but don't either don't facilitate people actually trading or the trading like the other way around the no one trades in settlers if it turns into the vote who wins game where you know you people trade or don't trade 
based on who they like or their or the or, politicals or the heuristics. Right. Are you reading the Richard Garfield book yet? No. Can I start using the terminology from it instead of our own terminology? I'm going to start reading it soon because I just finished the book club. Because book. what we call vote who wins games, he calls the chip taking game. Right, Same well, thing. Well, describe the chip taking game. Is it a sim- is one of those simple example game theory Yeah, so games? the chip taking game shows how some games, because of the mechanics. The, now, here's another thing. Particularly, this is a flaw in games that involve direct fucking. Yep. Which is what we call, he calls it something else. Okay. But direct fucking is a game like uh, Vinci, where mm. I can attack Scott the player directly in the game. That is true. That is That has a lot of vote who wins aspects. So games that have direct fucking tend to have uh, vote who wins ideas. Right, because if you just, you can choose, a, if you're playing, say, three, four players, you choose who you attack, and... Whoever you attack, you're voting. You're basically voting for them to lose. Now so, they're falling behind. So here's the chip taking game. Every round, everyone has an action. Well, Every- wait. What do you have at the beginning? Yeah. So everyone starts with ten chips, and okay. on your round, you choose one person, take a chip away from them, and throw it in the garbage. Whoever is the last man standing with any chips wins the game. So wouldn't you just always? So round one, how many people are playing? Let's say uh, you, me, and Scott Johnson. Three people. Okay, so round one, I take from Scott Johnson. Round two, you're not going to take from you know Scott Johnson because you're already down one. Yeah. You're not going to take from yourself, so you take from me. And then Scott Johnson takes from you. So basically, whoever went... It depend, you know, depending on the turn order, right? We're basically... So we're all down to one, and then it's someone's turn. I guess I went first, right? So now I'm voting... Either Rim or Scott Johnson will be eliminated. And then, so I eliminate, say, Scott Johnson, then on your turn you eliminate me, or I eliminate you, and then Scott Johnson eliminates me. And now look, you, now he here's wins. the problem. You iterate through that. The game is either set or... Uh, who, if it's arbitrary, what if I it's choose? simultaneous voting to which chip to remove? Yeah, but even then, right? Because then round one, we both we all reveal our votes, and me, me, and you both, me and you both vote Scott Johnson. Now he's down two. So then in the second round, well, you're not going to vote Scott Johnson again. You're going to vote me, and I'm going to vote you because we just both voted Scott Johnson. So think but about Scott this. Johnson's going to pick one of us again. So think he about already this. picked one of us. In a game so he's probably like going to pick the other one of us. In a game like this now, the person who's ahead. It isn't necessarily the person with the most chips because that's the person who's going to be fucked the most. Right. You would be thinking at least one or two rounds ahead of who's someone going to vote for, right? Because, you know, in round one, we both voted for Scott Johnson. He's down to eight. Uh, he voted for me, so I'm down to nine. You're still at ten. So I'm going to vote for you, and he's probably also going to vote for you, and then you're going to vote for me, <laughs> right? So then we're all down. So, but then I'd know that you were doing that. So the determining factor of the game is either arbitrary political bullshit or attack rim. He's going to win. Right, but it also you get a little bit, especially when the chips are getting low. Like when someone has two chips, suddenly it becomes the stick game of unstable state because if you only have two chips, you could theoretically be eliminated that immediately well no then it doesn't become the stick game it becomes the game is already over game (laughs) or it becomes the brinksmanship game of scott if you don't attack him he's gonna win so which is a problem in many games basically i'm at two and you're both at one the only chance you guys has of winning is if you both vote for me anyway the terminology that uh, garfield uses but but one of you will die because i'm attacking only one is that these many games just boil down to like the mechanics don't matter the actual decisions that matter are just which player do I attack? Yep. Who do I fuck? And, and that's that- basically deciding which of the other players will lose and your own fate is out of your hands. Unless, you know, you would obviously pick the person most likely to vote for you, but that's really all there is to it. So, once again, the, you know, just to kind of show how cool this book is, just because it gives us terminology for all this stuff. Look at Settlers. I used to win Settlers a lot in our crew before uh, everyone got really good at Settlers. And the reason I was able to do it is that the settlers breaks down in that whoever's ahead, whenever the seven comes up, everyone tries to gangbang on the person who's winning so they don't win to give everyone else a chance to catch up. So the key to the game was to lay low and be in second place with a non-obvious way to jump ahead at the last second and Stiffy win. Stiffy cards. Or longest yeah, road out of nowhere. Being close to having longest road and largest army, but somehow other people don't notice because, and here's the way the game You don't actually described. have them in front of you? The game has... 
other players have a poor model in their head of who's actually winning. And that is the key in Traders of Genoa. It is really fucking hard to tell who is actually winning because somebody might be like hundreds of dollars behind you, but they might be having a fistful of completed large contracts. They just haven't cashed in yet. And as soon as you get near Via Paletti, boom, they just lay it out. Boom, boom. And they're just, you know, cashing them in big time right at the end of the game. Now, and there's nothing you can do about here's it. Here's where the game breaks down and that it's a little not fun. The big contracts are worth a hundred uh, dinars, ducats, whatever. Whatever Florence. the money is, yeah. Now the trouble with that is that the you know these big contracts, there's four places where you can cash them in. Anytime a player wants to go there and has at least three goods, everyone assumes pretty much correctly that they have a big contract and demands a large portion of the profits. So. It's a very predictable and unfun element of the game. There's no way to really bluff that. Well, but the point is, is that that person already paid out a whole bunch along the way to even get those goods, unless they were really lucky, and the contract itself. So it's like then to pay out a huge portion of the profits on the final end, it's like on the large contract, how much do you actually make? So, you know, if you have to, you know... The, oh, but I'm saying the, the act the more of you going have... for cashing it in is not fun no, because that's true. among smart and players... And you don't even get a contract, uh, a, uh, what's it called? So, the only reason people go after those, or the only way people go after them, is going after the things that let you teleport somewhere automatically. But then people realize that the that is wheel? the game determinator, determiner. So people now treat that the same way they treat the corners. And you can see how the game, that the negotiations around that, especially among smart, but not necessarily well-versed in the game players, is just not super fun. No. It's super fun among really apt players who are also smart. It's not fun among inexperienced players who are smart, but it is fun again if there's a few <laughs> inexperienced and unsmart players. And you're taking advantage of the nubs. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's like, you know. But that gets into the, the classic example. And Go then there's the whole thing where, like, there'll be a nub doing something dumb, and they'll be helping out, say, Rim, and I'll try to educate the nub and say, look, you're about to give Rim all this whatever. Uh, guys, advice. Look at what's Scott's going telling on you here. what to do. He's lying and trying to win. Uh, advice. Rim is the person who lies, and Scott never lies. And you know what the result of that is? Someone other than me and Scott wins a game like that. Possibly. But then I win because... That's anyway. because you didn't listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> If I tell you that the move Rim's about to make is going to earn him that much money and that you should ask him for Dude, at least this Dude, it's only much. like four victory points and Scott has a fistful of beer and whatever and that's how these games Yeah, go. it's only beer. You can't do anything with just beer. You know what? If you're a German-style Euro board gamer type and you like these kinds of games, Jenna was on the <clears throat> you might as well own it list. Yeah, I mean, the fact that you can trade anything for anything, you know, makes this game a whole lot of fun for the vast majority of people who like to play strategic games, you know, and it can only really be unfun for you if, A, you don't like trading at all, uh, B, you're, it's basically everyone at the table is me and Rim, me and Rim, or and it, you you all play like assholes and you, everyone knows everything that's now, going on. Now it's deceptively, on. despite looking like one or of those... C, you, none of you are smart enough to actually so, understand the game. The game looks complex, like Entdecker. If you just look at it, no, it's it's one of those deceptively simple games. Yeah, if you if you have someone else teach you the rules, the game is ridic simple to learn. I hate all these. That's one. Now the game sucks to learn if nobody at the table already knows how to play. That's one thing I really hate about a lot of games lately. I've noticed is like. Like, you know, Agricola or this or... Yeah, if TNA. someone else teaches you how to play, it well, takes 10 if, minutes. Well, it's great. Even if someone teaches you, it's like they teach you so many things. Because you can't leave anything out, right? So they teach you all these rules and it takes a long time no matter how... Even if you're super fast learners and they go over all these different bits and cards and all these things... And then when you actually play, it's like, oh, this is really actually fast and simple. And most of those rules I had to learn don't come into play very often. And when they do, I sort of know them now and it makes sense. And this game is way easier to play. Well, you know what's play, interesting? But explaining the rules was not easy at all. One of the examples in Richard Carfield's book that it, I never thought of because it's I It's like hard to teach, easy to play. Because I don't like... I used to play games like Cribbage, Bridge, and whatever, and I really don't like games like that anymore. Uh, I like Hearts, inexplicably, and I enjoy Euchre, but I only enjoy Euchre if I cheat at it. <laughs> but anyway, so 
the the idea of the people who is teach, every show about board games actually going to be a review of the stupid book now? Until you read it, and I can just start <laughs> using the terminology from the book. <laughs> Granted, I like our term "direct fucking" more than his term, so I think I'm going to keep using that one. All right. But so, if you want, if people who teach that game, who understand that game, will usually also teach bidding systems in Bridge, mm. which are the systems of bidding to indicate to the other player whether or not you have a good hand and what they should do and all that bullshit, yeah. which is crucial to playing bridge. Without cheating. Yeah. But at the same time, really, really confuses new players and really obfuscates what the core mechanics of bridge are. And really don't, you know, I don't even really know the full rules of bridge, but like the, the scant details I do know... They make it seem like, wow, that's fucking stupid, right? What It's like if there's a special signaling system where, like, you can't communicate, but you can bid. So if I bid 10 and that's a signal to my partner to do a certain thing, now don't the other players know what that signal is, too, because it's a well-known system? Yes, so then the game, so then it's Street Fighter. You have this high-level game of using increasingly complex bidding systems or using a bidding system to bluff so the other team does it. But then wouldn't my partner know? Not If I'm trying to bluff and, you know, you're not allowed to communicate, so I try to fool the other players that are on the other team, but I end up fooling my own partner and we fuck ourselves. You got to trust the other player. What do you mean trust? That it's they like, understand the bidding systems enough. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, it's like, I think it's just nonsense. To me, I'll be honest, games like Bridge are taking a deck of cards and doing too much with it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I get that. I have I don't know the rules of bridge and I know a lot. I of, used to play a lot. There is a lot of advanced of bridge out there. Hearts, so I hearts, sort of want to respect cribbage. it, but I just don't know enough about it to, to really make a, you know, an, a, an informed uh, judgment. I just, I don't enjoy games like that anymore. I don't enjoy trick taking games with bidding systems. Mm. I like hearts too. Yeah, but <laughs> hearts is also we get to, we have we ever done a show on hearts? I think we can do a whole show on hearts. I could do a whole fucking show on hearts. You shut your mouth. <laughs> Microsoft hearts. Uh, FrontRowCrew.com archive hearts hearts. <laughs> we did a special on it on September 11, two thousand seven. There you go. Huh? Geek Notes is already like two years old. I know. Hearts is a good game. <laughs> now it's. Seven years old. Anyway, I think we're done. You know what, Genoa? It's it's if you care about German style board games, you should own Genoa. Yeah, sure if you're the entry on your shelf, this right is like there with Puerto Rico. Well, this is like the Decker. second. This is the second tier, right? Like if you are already, you know, if you're hardcore in the European board games, this is the second tier game. You got to get it. But if you're a dabbler or a newbie or whatever, this is not the first tier, so it should not be one of the first games you buy. You should, but like once you've already covered like the A plus games and you're looking for more, then Genoa is one of the first games you should go start to look at. I mean, it's Board Game Geek rank. 172 out of many thousands. So I, that is not bad. I actually really kind of want to play Entdecker again now. Oh, with the huts? The yeah. huts are the only good part. No, fuck the huts. You thing is, you say the huts are the good part. One, they're not. And two, how come you always fuck up the huts? I'm not just saying I'm good at the huts. Yeah. I just really like that there's little huts and they're hidden and you sort of walk these dudes over to go investigate. And it's all, The game's all about risk management. It's physically fun, the huts. And you know what? All that Entdecker has taught me in my entire life of playing it with smart people is that one, humans fucking suck at pattern recognition and they fucking suck at managing risk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. 